Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley is now acknowledging the Civil War was, quote, about slavery. This after facing backlash from both Democrats and Republicans over her answer to a question last night that omitted that in New Hampshire. For more on the state of the 2024 race, Terry Sullivan and Joel Payne join us now here in Studio 57. Terry, of course, is CBS News political contributor and served as the campaign manager for Marco Rubio's 2016 presidential campaign. And Joel is also a CBS News political contributor, Democratic strategist and chief communications officer for Move On. Uh, thanks to both of you for being with us. Terry, let me start with you. Um, Haley's Republican competitors really going after her after those comments that happened last night. Uh, let's listen to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis respond to this earlier today. I noticed that um, uh, Nikki Haley has had some problems with, with some basic American history. Uh, you know, she's asked a very simple question and responded with just a really incomprehensible word salad of this shows uh, this is not a candidate uh, that's ready for prime time. So, Terry, is it fair to say that her campaign right now is majorly in damage control? Yeah, I don't know they're majorly in damage control, but it certainly is a, a, a sign that uh, uh, they're not quite ready for prime time at this moment. Mm. Um, from a candidate quality standpoint, um, she whiffed what should have been a very easy question. I don't think I don't think anyone really believes she's this closet racist. Um, but I, but I do think you know she gave a terrible answer, and then it's, the bigger thing is it took her campaign uh, you know, twelve hours to try to clean it up. Which right. and so this is much more about you know look she's she's now made a surge and now she's getting the scrutiny that top tier candidates get and and she's not doing real well at it at the moment. So Joel, this is someone who could be the the person who polls next best to Donald Trump. How closely is the White House looking at this situation and how she is rising in the polls? Well, look, I think uh, President Biden was actually pretty vocal for quicker. They moved quicker on this, to Terry's point, uh, than the Haley campaign did with the response to mm -hmm. it. What, what this whole incident says to me something is, is something larger about kind of the modern Republican Party. And it's the fact that she felt like she had to do this, this word salad, as Ron DeSantis said it, and as a lot of others have said it. I think it shows that the center of the Republican Party is not holding, particularly in these culture war issues related to how we talk about pretty clear incidences in the past of, um, you know, things that now is defined as woke in the Republican Party, right? Mm. It's not woke to say that the Civil War was about slavery, but the median Republican voter, I think that folks like Nikki Haley think they want to hear what she said. And that's the challenge when you're trying to build a 50 plus one coalition, is how do you get the math to work? Right. I don't think Nikki Haley can get the math to work, and that's what jumps out to me. You know, when you look at a, a scenario like we just observed over the last day. I wonder what you think about that, Joel. Like, is the line blurry here? Yeah, I don't think it's blurry at all. And, and, and you know, I like the way that Joel's, Joel says, well, she might not be racist, but the entire Republican Party is, is racist or, you know. And so, look, look, it, it, it was a gaffe. It was a dumb mistake. Um, I know that, that Joe Biden never makes gaffes um, when, when answering your question at all. Um, but um, and so I think it says much more about just giving a really dumb answer to a to a simple question, um, and and look, we both know what it's like to work for a candidate on the, at this point in time in the campaign. They are spread super thin. They don't even they're lucky to know what state they're in, mm -hmm. much less being able to answer questions. And so I think this was just an honest mistake, uh, you know, one that's going she's going to pay a price for. But I don't think that that this was she was trying to send you know telegraph anything about about her beliefs on on civil war and slavery. So let's talk about the timing then, because you mentioned timing. This is important and. How much of what happened last night is going to inform how she moves forward on the campaign trail now? Yeah, I mean, look, she's going to, she, she is, she, and Joel and I were just talking about this. She has to run a near perfect campaign yep. to mm -hmm. beat Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. This isn't a near perfect campaign. And so her problem isn't that, that suddenly voters are not going to be for her because they think she's got this position on this issue. It's that she's wasting critical time that she could be picking up new votes, explaining the dumb things she said. And it's the opportunity cost two weeks before the Iowa caucuses that she cannot get back. And so I think that's the real danger for yeah, her here. She's wilting a bit in the spotlight. I mean, I know we're talking about these comments about slavery now. A couple of weeks ago, she made some comments about uh, women's reproductive rights and how she would sign a six-week ban. Mm -hmm. That also is off script for who she is, the role she's playing as the normie Republican, as the Republican of the center. That's not what you say. 
So this is a scenario where she's being held accountable and she's facing new scrutiny over these comments. But she's actually been kind of stumbling out the gates for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, tough to be everything to everybody. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about some of the other people that we're looking at here on, um, on, on the GOP ballot. So Chris Christie's campaign, um, how is he doing and what does he need to do to sort of bridge this gap at this point? I think Chris Christie is playing the role that he is supposed to play, which is the uh, kind of the, the, the honesty broker, so to speak, mm. in the Republican Party who will take it to Donald Trump. I know he had an ad uh, today that uh, I was joking with a friend, kind of reminded me of like a West Wing style ad. Um, direct the camera, black backlight, um, talking about how uh, how he would uh, how he would hold Donald Trump accountable. I know we're maybe going to show. Let's take it a look at that. Yeah. Some people say I should drop out of this race. Really? I'm the only one saying Donald Trump is a liar. He pits Americans against each other. Every Republican leader says that in private. I'm the only one saying it in public. So I guess, is this a make or break moment for him when you're still polling in the single digits? It's a make or break moment. But look, Chris Christie, and if Chris Christie and Nikki Haley have the same objectives, which I think they do, which is to defeat Donald Trump, one of them's got to get out of this race. And Nikki Haley, frankly, has the higher ceiling of the two. And I think before New Hampshire, before we get to the New Hampshire primary, I think they have to kind of make a pack that they are going to be the anti-Trump Republican coalition. Mm. And there's not room for both of them and for Donald Trump. To, to be held accountable. See, is that possible, though? Like, yeah. is it possible to be Trump? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's possible, but it's not looking likely at this moment. I don't, th I don't think uh, Haley and Christie have the same objective. I think Haley actually wants to win the nomination. Mm -hmm. I think Chris Christie, this is a vanity project for him. Got to remember, this is the guy who was the first mainstream Republican to endorse Ro uh, Donald Trump in 2016. He dropped out of the race, and he endorsed Donald Trump. He ran, he staffed the entire West Wing. He was Trump's first pick to be the, the transition team lead. This guy has been through and through for Donald Trump, and now that he's decided it, you know, his, his friends in New York and, and, and you know, his, his deal on ABC News are, are in jeopardy because it looks like he's too Trumpy, he decides he's, he's the ultimate anti-Trump and he's this only straight shooter in the race. Look, he's tried to have it both ways, and he's trying to clean up his image as the guy who really kind of helped propel Trump in 2016. Okay, I just want to give you guys yeah. a couple of seconds here, 20 seconds just to wrap up. Final thoughts, Joel. Final thoughts are as we go Heading into, into 20, the new year. Yeah, as we go into the new year, I think one big thing I'm talking about is coalition. Mm -hmm. And you do have to build a 50 plus one coalition on the Democratic and Republican side. Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, to me, are the only two Republican candidates that have the potential to get 50 plus one on the Republican side. Nikki Haley, still not quite yet. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also think the other thing is, if you look at, is that Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, and Donald Trump are out polling Joe Biden right now. And that's a real problem for the Biden campaign, uh, especially as, as we start to get it to the where it's going to be a general election. He's going to have to engage on this. There's going to be some spotlight. And I think talk about withering under the spotlights. I think Joe Biden's going to do that. OK, lots to follow here. Really interesting conversation. We'll have to leave it there for now. But thanks to both of you for being with us. Terry Sullivan and Joan, Joel Payne, we appreciate it.